We got a lot of people coming in. I'm excited. It's good. Mm -hmm. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and get started in the interest of time. And I want to welcome everybody to part two of our uh, league membership training. This is focused on the Alabama League and the local leagues. And it's not we're this is this is a sharing. Um, this is this training is going to be more of a talking to you about what we're doing and and um, basically giving people some information about the different things that the league is doing. It's not all it's not a all inclusive. But um, but it is going to give people enough information so you kind of know if you see something you want to get plugged into, you know, then reach out and let us know. You can let me know and I can connect you with the right folks. And let's see, I guess we got a couple of people still trying to join, but OK, we'll go ahead and get get started. Yeah, for for some reason, they're not uh, they're not coming in. We've admitted, but they're not able there to maybe do. maybe they'll they'll um, may have to try it again. All right. So this kind of gives you an agenda. It's a pretty busy, but we're going to just start stepping. We're going to step through this and and um, and then. If you want to add, if you want to put your questions in chat, if it's something that you know you feel like you really need to to ask it while it's going on, then that's fine. This is this is less, I, I hopefully a little bit less. Um, we're going to have plenty of time to get through all this, and um, but if you want to hold your questions to the end, that that might be might be easier. But um, last week we talked about the three three levels of the League of Women Voters. And it's a tri-federated organization. There is a national level. Uh, there is a, a state, obviously the state League of Women Voters, which we have two levels, which is the general fund and the education fund. Those are two separate organizations. Uh, we do have some members at large that are not affiliated with the local league, and they are members at the state and national level. And then we have nine local leagues. And you can see they're spread out across the state um, when I've gone in and counted, I count 15 counties out of 67 that have a league, local league presence. And so uh, we're always looking for opportunities. If, if new member at large units want to begin the process of becoming a, a local league, then we would just be, we would love to start working with them to do that. And that's, we're looking forward to doing that maybe more if we can find groups that want to, want to start working with us on it. But this shows you basically the 15 counties that have local league presence. And there's the Shoals, the Tennessee Valley League, Greater Birmingham, Greater Tuscaloosa, the Montgomery League, the East Alabama League, which is Lee County, and then Mobile County, Mobile League, Baldwin County, uh, Baldwin League, and then the Southeast Alabama League, which includes Houston County and the area called the Wiregrass, which um, I am not sure exactly how many counties that includes, but I put down Dale and Henry because there is there are several counties that are covered by that wiregrass area. And with the tri-federated organization, the uh, you know as I said talked about last last week, the there is this the board of directors, which is the U.S. League. Then there's the C four C three fund education fund. And then there's a, a lot of different staff members that are part of the tier one organization. Then we're looking at the state level and we've got the board, two boards, general fund board and the education fund board. The um, general fund board and the education fund board have the same officers, which includes the vice president, the president, vice president, uh, treasurer, secretary. And um, in this this for this term, we actually have two vice presidents, and that's what's um, planned for next term as well after convention. And then um, each board has six directors, three elected during council, three elected during um, during convention on both boards. So there's six six directors elected, and um, and then on both boards. And then there's opportunities for appointed directors you know, when there's activities that require us to, um, that we need to bring on additional directors. 
Uh, there's also the Alabama League teams, which is what I'm going to really focus on this evening. And then the local leagues, and they have committees and teams at their at that level as well. So um, I'm going to I'm just wanted to show you this. This is the basically the flow ch flow chart that was adopted by the uh, state, uh, the League of Women Voter Voters of Alabama, and was presented to the state to the local leagues and adopted as the as the um, LWBAL advocacy team. Um, Robin Buckaloo is the director for the for the state um, for the advocacy for the board, and she is the co-chair for the advocacy team. And so I would like to invite her to, um, if you could spotlight her, Jean, she'll talk a little bit about what we're doing with the um, advocacy team. Okay, I apologize to anybody that's heard this talk before because I I wrote this down and I've, I've presented it one other time, but it's basically an outline of what we've been doing in the advocacy team. And I'm really not as sad as I look on the video tonight. I'm really doing pretty well. Um, so advocacy is the action of advocating, pleading for or supporting and an advocate is one that pleads the cause of another or one that argues for, defends, maintains, or recommends a cause or proposal. In our context, the League of Women Voters, uh, the last definition is the one that we use. The way we're organized, voter services supports individuals in attaining or restoring their voting rights and advocacy proposes policy and legislative changes which improved citizens' opportunities for civic engagement, including their ability to vote. Obviously, there's a fine line between voter services and advocacy, and many league members work in both areas. Many of the issues that voter services identify as problems for groups of individuals result in proposals for action by the advocacy group. Kathy, conceived the current concept, which she just showed you on that view graph uh, for advocacy several years ago. And it's really been an interesting journey uh, to where we are today. So our first big project was working on people powered fair maps under a grant that we got from national. That lasted about three years leading up to the redistricting effort, which took place after the 2020 census. In that effort, we analyzed gerrymandering in urban areas around the state. Uh, we looked at the disenfranchisement of Democrats, people of color and poor people, and uh, ultimately a number of League of Women Voters spoke at redistricting hearings and gave testimony as to why the map that the, the map that the legislature had been using was unfair and Kathy actually presented an alternative sample map that was developed under the aegis of the league. Uh, we know that that effort didn't succeed in terms of, of the state. The state, the state passed their own blatantly unfair maps, but there's still litigation ongoing that is has been directly influenced by the work that we did in that in that time, and I'm I'm very proud of it. Uh, we meet with various state legislators and officials. We had a really good meeting with Cam Ward, who is now the director of the Bureau of Pardons and Paroles, and we got a policy change that made it a little easier for formerly incarcerated people to have their voting rights restored. Last, last election, we analyzed the proposed state constitutional amendments as they were related to voting rights restoration and also other positions of the National League. And then we submitted re recommendations to the state board on which ones to support, oppose, or stay neutral on. We published the resulting positions. And I know for a fact that we changed some votes that some people intended to make on those amendments based on the, the policy analysis that the league did. I think there's a lot of potential there. 
uh, one of our big issues is government transparency. We've been pushing toward open records law reform for several years. If we don't know what's going on in Montgomery or locally, it's really hard to promote change. Right now, a state agency doesn't even have to respond if there is a request for information. It's interesting that during this past year, Governor Ivey published an executive order that is very, very close to the legislation that we were pushing that applies to at least the uh, executive agencies of the Alabama state government, although not to the legislature or any other independent agencies. Uh, we have produced a number, number of educational fora. We're trying to, in, to inform voters in Alabama and we have recorded these and put them on our website so that people can go back and look at them at their leisure. Coalition building is essential and we're currently in coalition with approximately eight or nine other state organizations. The most notable coalition is the Alabama Voting Rights Coalition, which is really uh, C4 efforts, but it is deeply involved in advocacy for, for uh, restoring felons voting rights and, and amending the laws in Alabama, which are very restrictive on the rights of former felons to, to vote. Uh, one of our most exciting current endeavors is called the Alabama Channel. And Kathy, is, uh, is Tara gonna talk about that? Yeah, she's online to talk about that. Okay. That's so, on the, yeah, that's, she'll talk. Yeah. So that's another weapon that Tara will be telling you about that's, that is pretty exciting. We briefed that to the national president of the League of Women Voters when we were at the Selma Jubilee. And she was really excited about it. She had her husband with her, and it turns out that he's a software developer. And he was he was um, offered us some insightful comments and said that he was looking forward to to playing with it. We can't make everything happen by ourselves. We really would like the advocacy team to be larger and maybe segmented so that individuals could engage in advocacy on things that they're really personally interested in. Uh, we need members to help educate the citizens of the state. We need response to our calls to action. Uh, we know from talking to state legislators that if they hear from even 10 constituents on a particular bill, that they consider that to be a lot of correspondence. A call to action might be to mail postcards to the legislature legislators representing your district or to send them an email or place a call. It might be to gather and have a have a rally. There are all kinds of options to participate in advocacy. I can tell you that the Selma Jubilee was very exciting and there are other opportunities that are that are going to be coming up that are equally exciting. And I I hope that uh, more people will get interested in advocacy. It is really satisfying. Thank you, Robin. All right, I'm going to um, this next, we're going to go to the Alabama channel next. And um, I just, let's see, oops. So Tara, if, if you'll spotlight, Jean, if you'll spotlight Tara, she's going to talk next. And so I just wanted to show you guys the screen. If you look on the left side, this is the software that that I get to use to do the recording with Tara. And I it's actually it's been a learning experience on how to how to actually use a new software program that will, you know, to record the live stream from from uh, what's happening in the legislature. Tara, are you there? You are. OK. <laughs> All right, hold on just one sec. Okay, do you want to share your screen? Yeah, yes, so I'm, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Um, um, if, if you, you can, can allow, allow me, me to do that. that. There is a, a 
there's feedback. I don't know if you've got two, have you got two things running? No, no I, do I do not. not. Do, you do you still, still hear, hear feedback? feedback? Mm -hmm. Hmm. I don't, I don't know, know what, what to do, do about, about that. that right now. Um, there's, there's not, not two, two things, things running. running. So um, my, my other, other computer, computer is actually in use right now, now actually live streaming a city, city council, council meeting. meeting. <laughs> so, so I can't, I can't jump, jump on that. On that. Um, if, if it's still, still echoing, echoing it, might it might be distracting, distracting so, so you might, might want to walk, walk through, through this, this caveat. I don't, don't want to. Can't hear you. Do you want me to go to a different topic and let you call back in and see if. Yeah, you know, let, let me see, see if I can come, come back, back in and, and, and do, do this. this. All right. All right. I'll do, I'll do that. that. See you in see you in a minute. Okay. Um, okay. If you'll stop, well, I guess it'll drop yeah. off. Stop. stop. Okay. All right. So we're going to be flexible here and switch topics. And so um Carol Mosley, if you're if you're ready, I did not have any charts to show for DEI team, but I was wanting that was the next one up. If you could spotlight Carol Mosley. Let's see if I see her. There she is. Hey. Here I am. Hi, everybody. There are actually, I think, four members of the DEI task force on this call. I, I saw four. Somebody else may have also come in. So all of you, please uh, uh, jump in if you want to add anything. And then I'll, well, actually, I'll just go ahead and, and say the people that are here. Um, Janine Norman is here from Baldwin County. Katie Maytorell is here from Tuscaloosa. Darlene Freeman from Tuscaloosa. There's somebody else. So we've we are we have been meeting as a um, task force now uh, very seriously for the last few months and. Uh, this effort, this task force and this effort for diversity, equity and inclusion actually started at the national level in uh, 2017. And then Barbara Cadell, when she was state president, organized uh, the, the group to begin to work on things here in Alabama and to get us going. So Barbara did Barbara did a lot of the early work and uh, we we had some fits and starts. We did a couple of things early on that uh, probably were not that helpful. And and I, I think that, that I'm looking at that as, <laughs> as a learning curve for what we actually need to do. So in the last few months, the task force has settled on a plan of beginning our work with the members of the league around the state by just having conversations. And we had our first one just a few weeks ago on a Saturday. It was uh, it seemed to be very well received. And, and Katie noted afterward in our debrief that it seemed like the members who came were really hungry for this kind of conversation. So that is that is what we're starting with now. It is pretty informal. We hope to do this for another two or three sessions. And after the three or four sessions of just having people talk with each other, the task force will try to come up with, or we will, we'll, we'll figure it out. We'll come up with what we think is a good plan for offering members in the state something helpful in terms of education or further discussion or uh, perhaps meeting with uh people who are doing this kind of work in other states. So that's the kind of uh, that's the kind of approach that we are taking right now. We did have uh, one very successful workshop with everyday democracy for board members. And as a part of that work, we also did a survey and a, dem a demographic survey of our members all over the state. So that's uh, uh, something that Kathy really wanted to do as a baseline. 
We can look back at that. We can do another survey in a couple of years and hopefully keep those going every couple of years. And we'll get an idea of whether we uh, are changing in our in our league and in, in, in what ways we're changing. So when we talk about diversity, we're looking at uh, race and ethnic group, age, gender, um, educational level, and uh, and actually a number of others others than that. But those are the main things that we looked at in the survey. When we're talking about our um, Efforts for inclusion, the kinds of things that we've talked about, and I know this has gone on at, at all the local leagues as well, is what are the barriers for someone to join the league? And that some of that is logistical. Where do we meet? When do we meet? And some of it uh, is a little, is a little, and not that those aren't tough, but uh, some of the things that come up as barriers are even, even more difficult than those just logistical problems. So those are things that as we have these conversations with each other, the folks who join the conversations who are really interested in this topic are brainstorming about what that means to be inclusive and how do we and how do we get there. And in terms of the E part of the DEI, the, the um, equitable, that's something that uh, we haven't delved into a lot yet as a task force, but it, it's a, a it underlies everything that the league does. And so how to pull those pieces out and, and talk about them will be will be something that we'll continue to do. We do have a guiding document. It is a, a, a DEI plan that we based on the national DEI plan. So we, we do have that as a guiding document. It is not... Uh, at this point, a really useful document, but everybody who wants to can 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 take a look at that and uh, see what you think about that. And if you want to contact me, then I can send that to you and also um, send you, if you're interested in knowing what the task force does, I'll certainly add you to our uh, the, the minutes we send out or the link to the video of our meetings if you're if you're that interested. We could use some more members. It'd be great to get some members from every league in the state so we don't have anybody uh, right now from uh, southeast Alabama or east Alabama. I think we've got somebody from every other league. Those two were, were we could use uh, a member. Any of you here are in one of those leagues and are, would like to join us. Let me uh, open it up now to the other people that on the task force that are here and see if they want to add anything. Katie, you, I'll just check with you first. You're the first name I see on my screen. Did you want to add anything to anything I've said? You might you might be on mute. Check and see if you're on mute, Katie. She is muted. I'm gonna see if I can push the unmute button. See if she I sent her a ask to unmute, which sometimes helps. Yeah. Can we see her face? Um I don't I don't think she's got her camera. Hold on just a second. Um, well, I'll, I'll uh, Katie, if, 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 while you're unmuting, we'll I'll see if anybody else wants to to speak about any of this. Um, Darlene, do you you want to add anything? I just am so pleased that we are going forward with this work. It's something that's long overdue for the league. So I think we um, are off to a good start and we need as much feedback and participation as we can encourage. Uh, Deneen, you want to make a comment here? I'm not sure if we have someone from the Mobile League on the DEI task force. 
Correct. We do not. Thank you. I'm on the Baldwin. I'm second vice president on the Baldwin County League, and it's really exciting work. And I encourage all of you to attend our Zoom discussions. But if you want to join, we could use the help because we need all the ideas and the creativity we can get. Let me try Katie again. Katie, do you get unmuted to add anything? So our next uh, uh, discussion for all league members is April 29th. We're doing them on Saturday mornings, hoping to catch people before they get their day going, 9.30 to 10.30, and everybody will be getting an invitation to that uh, early next week. So we'll, we'll be inviting all of you, but if you want to go ahead and put down April 29th as uh, to spend an hour uh, with with a lot of like-minded people who are thinking about what it means for the for the league to to increase our diversity and our inclusion and and certainly our equity. So that's at 9:30 on the 29th. All right. Thank you, Carol. All right. We're, I saw oh, Terry. Right. Janine has another Janine had another point to make. We're going to also offer practical tips about how to make DEI more important in your own life and locally in your local leagues. Thank you, Janine. All right, I think Tara is back. We're going to see if if you're all right. Carol, was that was that all that you yep. had? Okay. So, Tara, do you want to try it again? Yeah. Am I echoing? No, you're great. Yay. Good. I have a headset. Maybe that's the trick. I don't know. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again. <laughs> All right. So hi, everyone. I am the director of the Alabama channel. And as uh, Kathy was stating, she helps me record meetings right now. Um, but I was want to walk you through real quick what the Alabama channel is and why it's been needed in our state. Um, so the Alabama channel is basically re-live streaming and archiving all of Alabama's legislative meetings that are currently being live streamed through Allison, which is the legislative website. Um, and so we go in, we re-live stream them, and then we make all of this available in an archive so people can go back and watch these meetings. Prior to the Alabama channel existing, um, you could not go back and watch meetings after they happened which was a problem if you uh, lead a busy life or you have children or whatever the case may be that would cause you to miss um, a live stream, especially some of these live streams, you know, for the House and Senate can go up to seven or eight hours. Um, so you're just not gonna be able to sit through all of that. Um, so just a real quick, um, how to use the website. If you go to the alabamachannel.org and then click on watch meetings, this is where you're gonna see the entire archive of the videos that we've captured so far. Um, on Tuesdays, you typically will see, you know, the, a couple committee meetings, not too many. Um, the House and Senate will convene. And then on Wednesdays is our biggest recording day. Um, that's where you're gonna see a lot of different committee meetings, a lot of bills being discussed. And then on Thursdays, you have a longer House and Senate session typically right now. Um, but what's cool about our tool is that you can search for not just a bill number, but you can actually search by a topic that you might be interested in. Um, so there's been a lot of uh, train derailments lately. So you might be curious if uh, the word uh, railroad was ever spoken in a legislative meeting. So if you click on railroad, and you hit search, it goes out and it finds all of the different times that uh, the word railroad was mentioned in any of the meetings. And as you can see here, uh, it brought up a joint transportation committee back in July, uh, July 26, 2022. And then you look down further and under the captions, it'll tell you a little bit about what it found, where it's found that word railroad. Um, so you just click on that. And then it'll bring up, let me see if my volume's up. Hopefully it'll work so you can hear it. Can 
everybody hear that? No, I think when you share it, you might want to re reshare it with the, with, with, the yeah. volume, with the sound. Oh gosh, okay. I can tell you're on there. the PC because it's yeah, it's, I'm, I'm always used to being on a Mac. And so when I share on a PC, I always forget to select that. Okay, I think we should be good now. Um, Thank you very much. Sure. Any further questions of the committee members on Zoom or in person? Thank you so much for coming. We appreciate your time. So Thank you, Chair. This, this was a person. Committing um, to come back. We'll see you in October with some follow-up reporting as well. Absolutely. They were there from the railroad uh, commission or some, something involving the railroad. Anyhow, um, you can get in there, you can see what's going on. You can you know, follow bills through Allison and then come back, watch the recording on the Alabama channel. Um, and then when you find those moments, like you maybe you're following a piece of legislation. I know there's some interesting legislative legislation coming up um, this actually Wednesday divisive concepts is coming back in. There's um, a, There's been bills that have passed on uh, fentanyl and people who deal fentanyl. Um, so that's something, there's bills about holding cell phones <laughs> that have come up this session and probably former sessions as well. But when you find those moments and you really wanna share them with your friends and family or on social media, um, you can come down here and actually share that direct moment on Facebook, Twitter, you can embed it into a website. So there's some really cool things that you can do with it that we're wanting people to, to really start using this tool in this way. Uh, when we re-live stream meetings, we do that to uh, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and our website all at the same time. So it has as you know, many eyes as possible on it. Um, we could always use more volunteers <laughs> when it comes to recording and just really getting the word out. So even if you don't have the time to help us record meetings, um, just using the tool and sharing it to your own social media and talking to your friends about it, it would really help us out. Um, does anybody have any questions? Here, I have a comment. You didn't show them how you could enlarge the, the clip to find more of the conversation. Enlarge it. Are you talking about you? You honed in on a certain time when you when you searched on the topic, and then you said if you want to hear more of the conversation, you can change the the beginning and end time so that you get more oh. of the conversation. Yeah. So if you get so if you search for something, we can go back and do um, a search on uh, absentee. We'll see if absentee pulls anything in here. Okay, so absentee, if I go down here, it says for, for an absentee ballot request form. So that's something I'm interested in. I decide I wanna click on that and hear more, click on it. And then it pulls it up. So this is actually going out to YouTube to pull in this video. Then when you hit play. For a absentee ballot request form. You don't know that in advance. So we got to that point, but as you can see, we, we got straight to that point. What we might wanna do is back it up just a little bit when we're sharing it to, to capture the entire conversation that's had about this, you know, this back and forth about absentee ballots. So if you do that and say you back up to, um, by let's see, five hours or four hours, 57 minutes, and that you know that that's where the conversation starts for that, you would come down here and retype exactly what that time stamp said um, so that you can share it and it'll start right at that moment. Yeah, thanks Robin. Uh, we do have a disclaimer on here that the Alabama Channel is a nonpartisan voter education project of the League of Women Voters of Alabama Education Fund, and we are not affiliated with Alabama state government. Um, so that's something that the legislature actually, the legislative services um, wanted to be sure we included in this, that we have no affiliation and that uh, all the meetings are transcribed automatically on YouTube. And so, of course, that might mean that they're not 100% correct, but they're actually pretty, pretty darn accurate. Yeah. Any well, other questions? Did, did, did the league create this? Oh, yeah. So the oh, um, this is great. So, well, the Open Media Foundation, we we created 
the shell of the website and everything. And so in doing research, I found that Alabama is only one of four states who are not currently archiving their legislative meetings. And so we searched out uh, and, and called, called on some of the other states. And one of those states was Colorado. They use a company called the Open Media Foundation and they're a nonprofit in Colorado, uh, the Open Media Foundation is. And so in talking to them, they have this product that they sell to states, um, but they were willing to, to give it to us to use for free um, because of they value government transparency. Um, so it's, it, they've been great to work with and um, we're able to use that for the Alabama channel. And yeah, I was gonna mention that, you know, when we started this, you know, we were, we were asked to, um, we were advised by the uh, National League just to go in and make sure that we weren't going to run afoul of any kind of, uh, you know, copyright, which it's hard to imagine a, a state government meeting being copyrighted. But, but so, so um, I contacted this, some people I knew down in Montgomery, and then we ended up having conversations with the, um, the director of the state archives, the director of the legislative services agency. And then we went and talked to the the secretary and the clerk of the House and the Senate, because, you know, we felt like we needed to have this conversation, but we also wanted them to know what we were doing, that this wasn't going to be su a surprise when they started seeing us live streaming or recording their live streams. And so, you know, it's been, it's been, you know, I think it's really, for one thing, it's been trans it's transformational for Alabama to have this capability. We've, you know, Tara is basically the mastermind behind this. And then she's gotten some of us on, in the league to, to help her do specific tasks like recording, which is, you know, I think that by itself having, there's been a lot of times over this legislative session already and before the legislative session where she'd see a meeting about a topic like that we knew that Alabama Arise was interested in. And, and we, you know, we'd reach out to Robin Hyden or, to the cover Alabama person. And we'd say, you know, there is a meeting in this room. It's not being live streamed and they would send somebody to that meeting. So this, this is kind of just this entire effort, I think is helping bring people together and make them, you know, organizations that are, you know, we're all basically watching what's happening in Montgomery, but they can't always be in the room where it happens. So this Alabama channel has been, you know, has been, I think it's being transformational for Alabama. So there's a lot of opportunity for volunteering though, because that's, you know, Tara, Tara has just a few of us that are recording. And if someone is, you know, you know, comfortable with, you know, technology would like to learn about the the system that I showed you that screenshot, you know, it's not, it's not super hard, but it just takes you downloading software and then getting all the settings right. But she helped me figure out what that meant. And, yeah. and if it ever goes away on my computer, I'll be lost, but, but I know she'll be able to get, get it back. Yes. And, and this, uh, the Alabama channel really could be the tip of the iceberg. I mean, there are opportunities if you're really interested in your local government as a league member, I think there are just opportunities to see this tool be expanded and grow um, potentially throughout Alabama. So just reach out and um, I'd love to talk with you and you can you can contact me, the Alabama channel at lwbal.org. Um, you can email me there or you can just send, uh, send me a message through the website. So yeah. Tara, you might mention that, that they provide the software for free to small municipalities. Yeah, so so if a municipality is interested in using this, I think it's 5,000 residents um, or less can municipalities with that can use this tool for free. Um, and, you know, there might even be opportunities for for citizens. We recently just found out about a potential uh, something that's happening where the uh, person found out about the Alabama channel was really excited about it and they're a government transparency person and not a part of the league but they're starting their own um hoover channel the, the hoover channel so we just found out about that just just today so i think there's a lot of potential for growth and transparency um using this tool all right thank you tara all right so 
I'm going to reshare my screen again. All right. And so I was going to mention that uh, Tara is a co-founder of a civic organization, which she can talk about. And it'd be good to have her come back in a, at another session to talk to you about this organization called I Vote Madison that she is she founded with co-founder Heather Morgan, who is also a league member. And that's going to be a, that would be a whole nother topic. But I wanted to mention that she's not here tonight because she's actually I think she and Tara are covering meetings. And but this Disability Voting Rights Coalition is an effort that we started back in September. And Heather has agreed to to help um, to work with the state league on continuing the effort that was started in in September. So this is a brand new uh, coalition that we would like to form. It what you can see the two women that are in this screenshot. This was called Power the South, and I saw I see Demetrius is online tonight. But this was the Power of the South. The Power of the South is an effort that has been was the brainchild of the National League. And they're going from state to state to state. And they started in the South. And we were the very first stop in um, for, the, for the inaugural Power of the South tour. And we focused on disability voting rights. And so we brought together um, representatives from organizations that work with dis disabled citizens and with a really strong focus on voting rights. And after, after the meeting, they asked if we would continue to bring people together. It was not just disabled um, disability groups, but also the more traditional, like the League of Women Voters that we're not focused always on one topic. You know, there's, we've, but we would bring together groups like we had in the room in September, um, groups from local groups. We had Human Rights Campaign. We had a lot of other organizations. And the fact that you bring all these groups together to focus on how do we address some of the barriers that we know exist for dis disability voting rights. The National Federation of the Blind also had people there. And I think I, I saw Barbara Manuel is on the in the uh, on the call tonight, but she's been she she has been an, an amazing ally working on different bills legislative during the advocacy effort. And now she actually joined the Mobile League. Um, I look forward to working with her on this coalition as well with her and, and Kathy, could you go to full screen uh, slideshow mode so that we can see them? Yeah, I forgot to do better. that. Thank, Thank you for you. mentioning that. Thank you. All right. Let's see if I can get figure out how to advance my. Now, let me let me stop share because something happened just now. My mouse stopped working. Isn't it great when PowerPoint has a mind of its own? Let me stop share. I may not be able, for some reason, it didn't want to. All right, I'm just going to make it bigger. Because for some reason, my mouse is not working. I think my mouse is starting to have a cow. AI, Kathy, AI. <laughs> yeah. It's like, why in the world? It was working. All right, let me just see if I can make this thing bigger. All right. All right, the mouse was not working for some reason when I went to full screen. So uh, I really just wanted to, to mention that this is a brand new, brand new effort that we are working on to really focus on um, disability voting rights and it was especially eye-opening when you read that the CDC estimates that one in three people in Alabama, adults in Alabama, have a form of disability all the way, you know, um, from mobility uh, to learning disabilities to uh, visually impaired. There's several different categories, but if you take all that together, we've got over one third of Alabama adults that have a disability. And so we need to really figure out how we can um, overcome the barriers to, to voter participation and and the, their attempts to be able to to um, you know to get the state of Alabama to to provide accommodations for for people who are wanting to vote 
but right now this the system we have is really not um not equitable for people with for example um vision if they're impaired vision it's it's just um they've got there's a whole series of barriers and um when you see an invitation to participate in this in these meetings we would invite you to join and uh, help us you know help us build this into something that we can actually uh, it's more than just legislative advocacy some of it like this past year uh, past fall several of the folks in the league um, went out and and when we went to go vote like i went in and said i want to use the express vote machine and jenny lux who is one of the people in this picture had done a demo for us at the public testing um, that was here in madison county and so when I went in, I'm like, I want to use the voting machine. And, and then the person in my polling place actually asked me what was my disability, which all by itself, by them asking me that, I knew, you know, they had violated AD, you know, the Americans with Disabilities Act. They not, they're not supposed to be asking you what your disability is. So, you know, the, us getting out there and walking, um, you know, supporting um, people with disabilities to make this you know, a, a more of an issue that they have to face, I think is going to help all of us be able to get, you know, better, better, a better, more equitable system. But Kathy, you know, I've, I've lived in Alabama now 10 years and, um, you know, coming from Illinois, we comply with ADA since the 80s. And that was one of the things that struck me when I got here that, you know, even this town, Huntsville, that's supposed to be so progressive, they don't follow, you know, they don't comply with ADA in half of the buildings that access the public. Yeah, exactly. Well, I wanted to invite, and Barbara, I did not ask you, Barbara Manuel, I did not mention this to you before the meeting, but if you would like to uh, come on and make some remarks, I, I would welcome, if you got something you want to say about you know, the challenges that you, that um, people who are. Sure, can you, everyone hear me? Yes. Hello? Yes, oh. I hear you. Hey, Barbara. Hmm. Okay, good evening, everyone. As Kathy has mentioned, I'm Barbara Manuel. I live in Automobile, Alabama, and I am blind. And uh, I am the president of the National. National Federation of the Blind of Alabama, and I also serve on the National Board of the National Federation of the Blind. And as a blind person, I can share with you how difficult and cumbersome it is to uh, cast a vote. As uh, Kathy stated, this uh, Automarks machine, which is most locations are going now to the express. Barbara, that vote machine. Some of us. Barbara, we've lost your audio. I'm sorry. So, Barbara, I, we have. I apologize. I guess I put you. I put you on the spot, and you're probably not in a good place to for reception. But um, we're having trouble hearing you. I will mention to everybody on the call that Barbara. Barbara worked, her, her organization uh, collaborated with the league about a year ago to do a, a program called Voting While Blind in Alabama. And that is on our uh, state league YouTube channel. And that is, an, that is just, you know, really something that I encourage all of you to watch. And um, I think, did she just drop off or is she, I think she might have had some reception. Oh, there she is. But, um, yeah, she's. This is. Um, this is. This is an example of where legislative advocacy kind of has really brought us a whole new. You know, it brought Barbara to the league, but it's also opened up a whole lot more collaborations. And so it's been a. It's we've grown from, from, everything seems to connect to uh, you know to each other. So there's nothing that we're doing that doesn't have, seem to have a, end up affecting everything else we're doing. All right, I'm gonna go to the, there. Let me see if I can go full screen again. Maybe it'll work. Mm. I'm gonna go back and see if I can 
get rid of the full screen that I had. Just one sec. Well, now I'm screwed. <laughs> oh, shoot. Just one second. I am. Regarding disability rights, um, the League of Women Voters on a national level did um, a survey that they sent to each state league that we were all filling out when we went to vote. I think it was in 2018 or maybe even 2016. It was a while ago. And I thought that was an excellent um, survey to fill out about whether the machines were available at your local polling places and what was your experience and so forth. Maybe we should do another one like that on a state level. Yeah. Yes, we, I'll, I'll talk, I'd like to talk more on that because I think I had a problem because I had the full screen open on two different places. But Janine, this, this is part of what this, um, this Disability Voting Rights Coalition is not, it, it doesn't have um, any boundaries as far as, you know, we're basically coming up, this is a group where we want to come up with ideas to help with, you know, how do we help address issues that need to be handled through legislative do, you know, doing surveys. I was, I wanted to mention, um, and Janine, this is something if you want to, I'll send these charts out with the recording. This QR code is a survey that the net, that the state league is doing to understand the barriers that people are experiencing with disabilities. So, you know, it, it is our first attempt to try to get data, actual data, um, from people across the state on where there's, you know, the issues that are out there. And, and then the coalition would, would take that information and, and come back with recommendations. So look at that and see if it looks like what you've seen before. All right, so um, the next topic, Brian Lorge is our VR Voter Rights Restoration Network um, um, lead. And this is a network of, of volunteers that can participate at many different levels, all the way from local league, when you're out doing rights, when you're doing a voter drive and you come across someone that needs their rights restored, we want to give um, all of our members enough information so that they understand and, and have a flyer in hand that talks about the statutes that are considered disqualifying felonies, and be able to talk to the person to understand if they can go ahead and get registered to vote, or do they need to drop back and let us do an evaluation of using the Alicourt system. The, um, we, we've broken this out into categories, which are, we've kind of named them fun, fun titles. Our, our VRR warriors are people who've been trained to, uh, to uh, analyze, to look at a person's situation, um, using their birth date and their name, legal name, we can go in and and um, and look at their record and determine exactly based on that what they what they where they are in the system as far as whether or not they can go straight to register to vote or if they need to get a certificate of eligibility to register to vote and if they have fines and fees, we need to understand every we need a full picture of a person's situation. Then this group. Of, this group of our volunteers can do that. We also do have people who are Alicourt experts that are um, that can do the actual Alicourt evaluation. Um, that's what they do mostly. They're not out there in the field as much as the people who are doing rights restoration or other events. Um, and so they can look at the Alicourt system and, and um, give specific recommendations. And they work with the VRR warriors. And uh, then we have a few people that are the most experienced of the group that actually, when um, Robin mentioned going to the Alabama Bureau of Pardons and Parole, there was a, a small group of us that went to the, to the uh, Pardons and Parole Board. And, and we went back and talked to Cam Ward and his attorney, and along with representatives from Greater Birmingham Ministries and Faith in Action. And we took some 
situations, some cases that we had had brought to us by the Birmingham League. And um, in all of those, they actually agreed with us and they went ahead and gave these folks their serve. So it shows you that we are able to make a difference. But what's really exciting to me as well is the fact that through all of this effort, everyone that everyone that's reached, if they have a problem and we work with them to the end to help them get their serve, um, in some cases they're being denied and we're working with them to um, working with the registrars, working with Bureau of Pardons and Parole, and we're able to talk to them and explain to them what we are seeing. We've been successful each time. Now, our sample size is pretty small, but but to have that kind of success rate is, is significant. And it also maybe helps these registrars understand more about the fact that they, you know, how I think their training is not um, as complete as it should be. And every time we take them a problem where they have not um, evaluated somebody's record correctly, and we can turn that around, then maybe that'll be a learning experience for them as well. And so that we're always looking for volunteers who want to become uh, Alicorn experts. Now that would be also helping us with this through text campaign uh, where we do uh, rights restoration via text. And, um, and we're also looking for people who want to just be not an Alicorn expert, but someone who wants to do VRR at um, in their voter drives, we can work with them, with whoever that is, to you know to give you enough training where you feel comfortable talking to people who might have the right need to get their rights restored. Uh, vote four one one is another aspect of voter services, and this is this is actually um, I'm going to take it off of screen share so I can actually see folks. But vote four one one. Some of the response rate from the candidates is, to be honest, has not been so great over the last year. But one of the things that I find really helpful with Vote 411 is the fact that it does give, it gives people a ballot where even if the people, the candidates are not responding to our questions, you can see who did. You know, we send the questionnaires to all the candidates at the state level, the local leagues who are participating in vote 411 can send it to their local candidates. And you, the, per, the folks that we're talking to uh, in the public, and we, sh we show vote 411, if they put their address and their zip code, they get a ballot. They can pull up a ballot and see who's, who's on their ballot and they can see the ballot amendments. And so by able, being able to see that all in one place and if they don't answer the question, I guess that tells you something also, but, but even if they don't answer the question, the fact that they, there's not really a good place right now to, for someone to go in and say, before they get to the polling place, who's going to be on my ballot? And that's what Vote 411 does. It also, uh, one thing, and it's not, it's not always available, but when it's not election season, but during election season, it's also very helpful when you're talking to people about where your polling place is. And that's also on the Alabama Secretary of State's channel, you know, website, but it does give you one place, one-stop shop for, for the voters. And, and it also gives us, it gives us something that we can, that, you know, all of us can pull together and, and, um, you know, help give back, uh, voters the information they need to know before on who's going to be on their ballot. And um, this past year, I, I did want to say on that, one thing that I thought was nice is that the uh, National League, uh, actually, um, one of the things they wanted to do was to make this nationwide. Um, everybody has it across the state. And so um, they actually funded the, um, I don't remember what part of the, they, we, we had our state vote 411, but then they went in and actually um, funded the congressional was it gene was it the congressional they they funded the state legislative races uh, that's right the house and the senate represent. exactly yes yeah mm -hmm. and that was really valuable because you know this is where you know when we start when we start talking to people about why midterms matter you know you start looking at rep state representatives and state senators 
you know, that is where the rubber hits the road, meets the road. I get my, my metaphors wrong, but anyway, that's, they're very important. And I think it was such a great service that they did that. All right. So let me um, go back. I'm going to, I think we're almost to the end of the state league stuff and I'm going to switch gears. Candidate forums. We had the secretary of state, uh, Republican primary last year. We had the actual uh, general election one um, during the fall. Oops. And this coming year, I'm really excited. We're going to have voter services directors on our board and looking forward to bringing together the voter services chairs from across the state and, you know, working together with our team to come up with any kind of shared me messaging um, figuring out is there election, you know, being election monitors working, you know, with a legal defense fund. We did that last year. Looking forward to doing it again in 24 and also sharing get out the vote messaging. So that's that's something that I'm I'm really excited about. Um, and then just to talk about some of the partnerships, uh, I call them partnerships versus collaborations. Uh, we actually have partnerships with Alabama Rise, Cover Alabama, Alabama Voting Rights Coalition, and the Sunlight Coalition. Um, and then we've got ongoing collaborations, which with that where we're working with on, on different tasks, um, Alabama Appleseed on driver's license suspension, Alabama Ford on a whole host of things, including redistricting, and, um, and also the, they're on the AVRC as well. And then Alabama Values has worked with us on different tasks and uh, NAACP, Campaign Legal Center, and then there's a whole host of others that we've been working with, um, including others like ACLU Alabama and SPLC. We do, we also have the, the YouTube channel, which we've had a, a pretty, I think we've had a, a very strong series of educational forums over the last several years. And if they're recorded, they go on our YouTube, like tonight's meeting is gonna go on the YouTube, um, I encourage you to subscribe to our Alabama, our Alabama YouTube channel. And when there is another educational forum, it goes right here on a playlist. And this could be something if you needed materials or if you just wanted to go out and watch, um, watch something that's happening that's ha on, on a topic that you care about. And now I'm going to switch gears mobile first. And I think Suzanne Swartz is. Where is she? There she is. I just came back on. Yeah. Here I am. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'm Jean, if you'll spotlight her and just take me off, then uh, each one of these three local leagues will be talking about what they're, what they, you know, so I just said, you know, tell us about the Mobile League or your local league and get folks excited. And I, I can't imagine a better person than Suzanne. You get, <laughs> you're pumped up. Oh, so. Thank you. Thanks for that introduction, Kathy. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Suzanne Schwartz. I'm the current president of the Mobile League of Women Voters. Our league was founded in 1955. Um, staff members. We now have 95 members, 83 are primary, uh, four are students, and eight are family members. So our numbers have fallen a little bit uh, with COVID as I think maybe many of us have, we're starting to pick back up and we're excited about that. But here in Mobile, we had a philosophy, when life hands you lemons, make lemonade. The Mobile League made a decision when we were first shut down by COVID that it, this was an opportunity for us to review our bylaws and how we were structured operationally. Long before President Biden presented his landmark legislation to address our crumbling infrastructure, the Mobile leadership team launched their own Build Back Better. The membership voted to approve these changes to our bylaws and our 2020 annual business meeting, and then we got right to work. Adopting changes and implementing changes are entirely different things. We knew that, that it would take at least two election cycles to completely implement the operational changes we proposed. Significantly, we added a president-elect to our board. This makes the transition to president much smoother 
and quicker. <clears throat> we made all the board members working board members with responsibilities for specific areas or what we call here portfolios. For example, programs, voter services, membership, advocacy, development, public relations, events, and policies and procedures. Here we stagger our elections. Our elections are coming up uh, April 29th, and we will elect one half of our board. Uh, so we have some continuity where we don't have all 13 board members uh, new. And to help recruit strong leaders, we wrote specific position descriptions for each member of the leadership team. This gives pers prospective nominees an idea of their responsibilities and an estimate of the time needed for the position. We found this to be very helpful. And when nominees accept a nomination are elected to the board, they have some sense of what um, their responsibilities are. Our goal is to spread out some of the tasks and encourage teamwork across portfolios rather than only vertically within a portfolio. For example, if you're planning a voter registration event, you can work with the events manager who will help you find a location and help organize volunteers. If you're doing a new membership orientation, you can contact each portfolio manager and make to make a presentation to about their portfolio and encourage them to join their committee or committees. We think it's working and we're seeing less burnout in our key portfolio managers. But building a strong league really focuses on membership recruitment and retention. Leadership needs to continually promote membership. Everyone, every member is an ambassador. We encourage everyone to wear their LWV pin whenever possible. Talk to people about the league when you're at other events. If you have a league t-shirt, wear it. Wear it to the grocery store, the bank, the post office, wherever. Believe me, people will ask you about the league. I have a voter rights restoration t-shirt that I wear often. I can think of at least six specific instances where people ask me for information for themselves or for a family member or a friend. Wearing your swag, LW, really, really works. But the biggest obstacle that we found to me is membership retention. The key is to get new members engaged right away. We have a new concept we're going to try that we modeled after the Junior League. We will create a placement committee that will work within the membership portfolio. Here's the idea. When we get a new member, our roster manager shares that information with the placement committee. A member of that committee makes a personal phone call to that new member, welcoming them to the league. During this welcome call, they ask what they're interested in doing what their skills are, or what new skills they're interested in learning, <clears throat> what they would like to develop, how much time can they devote to league activities, et cetera. At that time, they provide the new member with the name or names and contact information for the appropriate portfolio on where, what interests they expressed. All of this information is captured on a form which is then sent to the appropriate portfolio manager to follow up. So it's kind of a two-way street. The new member knows who to talk to, and the portfolio members, managers know that there's a new member that's interested in their portfolio. We're very excited about this endeavor, and we'll keep you posted on its success. Lastly, diversity, equity, inclusion is vitally important. Mobile is fortunate to have a very diverse membership but it doesn't happen by accident. Again, ambassadorship comes in. Talk about the league, our core values, our programs and opportunities when you meet new people. When you put together committees, be sure to remind your committee chairs to be inclusive when forming their committees. It's so easy to go back to your same old friends that you've for a long time. It's challenging to bring new members in that you don't know. 
but it's vital that your leadership teams and committees get new people in the pipeline. Your future depends on it. We're all rebuilding after COVID, delivering programs, recruiting new members, expanding voter registration opportunities are all continuing challenges which demand new, creative, and thinking outside the box leadership skills. Use every public opportunity to disseminate membership information. We develop new membership brochure, which we make available at every event we attend. For example, Earth Day, Creek Fest, Art Walk, Farmers Markets. The new transformation roadmap will have a dynamic impact on our local league, how our local leagues operate. It is what it is vital. that we all participate any way and every way that we can so that the future of the league fits our vision at the local level. One important thing to remember too, as I think Kathy pointed out, is always look for collaboration opportunities. Different communities offer different um, groups and organizations that have a similar vision or similar goals to the, the league. And it's important that we build these relationships, um, join their organizations if we have an interest and encourage them to join ours. So that's, that's what we're doing here. We're changing, we're growing. We have an older membership. We're getting younger members in. So we're having to better use technology and that sort of thing. Um, I'm a pencil and paper person myself. Um, but us old dogs are learning new tricks. So um, we feel happy, we're excited about the future. And um, if there's any questions that we can answer or any things that we've developed that you think might um, be helpful to your organization, uh, please contact me, Kathy can give you my information um, and we'll be happy to share it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, I am gonna hand it off to Julie Reese. Uh, she is um, she's vice president currently with the Greater Birmingham League, but she is president, she, I guess she's president elect or I'm gonna let her explain that. But um, so is she still on? I know, she, I'm sure she is. Just gotta find her. There she is. Okay, so if you'll spotlight her and and then you can talk about the Birmingham League. Hello, everyone. My name is Julie Reese, and I'm the vice president of the Greater Birmingham League of Women Voters. I became a member in 2020, and I started in voter services, and my primary focus has been on voter services. Um, we, I started in the middle of the pandemic, so that was a bit of a challenge, but we've gone to fairs, um, job fairs, you know, every kind of event that we can possibly imagine. Um, we've done many different things, including National Voter Registration Day, which we do every year, which is very exciting. But my true love is voting rights restoration. Um, living in this state, um, we have an over 8% felon rate in Alabama, so chances are someone you know has been impacted by a felony. We do our work at the Birmingham Pardons um, Board downtown and also at the Bessemer Bureau of Pardons and Paroles, and our voting rights restoration maven, who is Dana Ellis, who has basically started this initiative here in Birmingham. She's the one that has taken the reins and um, just is just doing an outstanding job with this. We also serve at Drug Court and we do this once a month at so at four different locations. So one in Bessemer, one in Birmingham at Drug Court, and then also at Pardons. It's something that it's really been a great opportunity for us. Um, we have, I think, over probably maybe 200 people we've served so far. Um, and, and I'm glad that Kathy mentioned the amazing legal team that we have, because without them, we couldn't do the work that we do. So even if you don't have any experience, say, in voting registration, you can come down to pardons or in drug court and you will meet people from all walks of life, every age, every ethnicity, every person that you, you know, can talk to. It's really cool because 
you get to talk to so many different people and most of the people are so grateful. We've had people who we restored their rights to, um, they didn't even know they had the right. They'll do a little dance right then. It's very renewing work. And I can't, I can't really say enough about how renewing it's been. Um, we've also in Birmingham, they've, we've helped establish a chapter at Sanford University. And it's our hope to go and carry this work into more universities. The person, Ellen, that's helped us um, with that has been amazing. The hard part getting into a college is having um, some a faculty member who will do that work. And it took over two years for Sanford to get their charter. So it's um it's been it's been kind of hard, you know, with that, but they've done a great job and we love working with the young folks. Um, they've been wonderful. We've done panels at the college. They are just great and we love working with the vibrant folks that are young. I was able to in, um, attend convention last summer and that was very exciting being, I'm a fairly new member, like I mentioned. So being able to go to convention, um, being a board member pretty quickly was very exciting to me and now serving as vice president. And then as Kathy said, I will serve as president next year. Um, I was very excited to attend convention and be a part of the, the democratic process for the LWV, learning about what um, positions they have taken and what they plan on doing in the future. I'm very excited for our board and for our organization. I will say also that um, our board is so diverse and so engaged and so energized. Um, we have many things, you know, that we're looking forward to doing. We're also, of course, holding our state meeting here in May, and we're excited about that. Um, but also a thing that she touched on that I have also written down and is partnerships. I also want to explain that we would not be able to do the amazing work we do here without the great strength and partnerships of, as she mentioned, the Alabama Voting Rights Coalition, also Faith in Action and Greater Birmingham Ministries, they help us out with so many wonderful things. Um, again, we just are looking forward to, you know, many, many things to come. I'm excited about my service um, to League and League has been great for me. I think a lot of people, especially during COVID, I was frustrated. What, what can I do? Um, so getting involved with League, uh, my mother was a member and um, so, and my grandmother actually, fostered my mother's enthusiasm about it because she, when the right to vote came, my grandmother had little voting rights parties. And that was something that my mother told me about. And I, you know, just being able to carry that enthusiasm for our precious, delicate rights. Um, my husband was talking to me tonight and he was saying that, you know, even dressing up as suffragettes, it gets people's attention. I think it's important to mention to people that even though we are the oldest voting rights organization in America, we're also the one that the least people have heard of. So I think we need to get ourselves out. Um, I think what Suzanne was saying is very important. We need to be more visible and um, just, you know, take what we have because we've got, we've got a lot of great organs, you know, a lot of great members and a lot of great ideas and a lot of great enthusiasm for voting. So thanks. Thank you, Julie. See, now we're going to switch gears again, and we're going to, I'm going to call Carol Prickett. Call Carol Prickett to the stand. I've been watching Perry Mason from the 1950s, so I'm going to call Carol to the stand and let her tell the truth and nothing but the truth. So um, I'll be glad to tell the truth, Kathy, and I'm going to speak about Greater Tuscaloosa and West Alabama, but I'm also going to <clears throat> share some things that I've learned across the last three years, a unique opportunity for me as second vice president of uh, LWBAL is that we've begun having, because of COVID, but something good had to come out of all that, having a once a month meeting on Zoom with every local league leader. And we come together for an hour on Sunday afternoon and the attendance and the sharing and the communication Excuse me, because we do have nine very unique local leagues, big and uh, busy Birmingham, uh, Shoals, Montgomery, smaller, much more on a personal level. We have different levels of membership. We also have ways that each of us has found to serve our local community. And the joy of being a local league member 
is that you get to work in your local community and serve your local community with the issues that are really important to that community. So for example, here in West Alabama, <clears throat> We have begun to work for a program at the University of Alabama. It got sucked by COVID and we're gonna revive it again. We have candidate forums for all of our local elections, as long as they are contested. And uh, we do have two people who will appear. We never have an empty seat election. Every year on Zoom, we have an annual meet your legislators night right before the legislative session starts. Our legislators say they look forward to this. We uh, prepare a list of questions, they come and talk. And here's really important, we post this on our YouTube channel. And not only is there a state YouTube channel, which I encourage everybody to subscribe to, but many of the local leagues, Birmingham, Mobile, Tuscaloosa, West Alabama, all have local YouTube channels. And if you went back on our Tuscaloosa YouTube channel, you would find all of the meetings we had by Zoom every month during COVID. You would learn about what Habitat for Humanity is doing. You would learn about the West Alabama Food Bank. You would learn about the Rape Crisis Center. As we inform our members, we also share this information with our community and anyone who wants to access on YouTube. Another reason to be active in your local league besides its uniqueness to your community, is that your voice and your choice of how to serve is up to you. If you want to be a busy, busy member and involved in several different things that really mean to you, something to you, the environment is one that many of our members uh, work on. Uh, voter education, voter rights restoration. You can tailor your participation to your particular level. And we find that that's a, an important thing. If you've heard the word opportunities once tonight, you've heard it a thousand times. There are opportunities to serve and that opportunity really comes first at your local level. That's how you meet, and this is gonna be my third point, that's how you meet the like-minded people in your community. I had lived in Tuscaloosa for three decades before I joined League. And I have to tell you, I did not know who the people were that I was passing at the grocery store, who supported the same issues, who were willing to work on the same issues, who were willing to teach me and then help me as I worked for the league in the community. So coming together as a group, we're not a social organization, but we do build a, a fraternity, a sisterhood, a, a every, every gender, every religion, every inclusiveness, of people who share our league values. We do try when we reach out to potential members to make sure they know what league values are, what our standings are on such issues as uh, reproductive rights or gun responsible gun ownership, because we do have league policies. Because another thing I wanna mention is that we don't work willy nilly at the local league. If you've watched the other uh, program from last week, you know that there are national policies that are written down that you can find out what the guidelines are and also procedures. And I'll give you an example. Our local library is very near and dear to all of our league members here, but our policy on how we're going to advocate for them and what we want to do for that local library is outdated. We're going to start a uh, process that is laid out by the National League and the State League that will tell us exactly how to investigate. We're not gonna become a puppet of the library system, but we will develop our own advocacy for how we will work with them and what we will support them for and what we will take stands about. And this is local service right down where the rubber meets the road in our local thing. We also have something that's statewide, in fact, it's a league tradition called the Observer Corps. Now, Tara talked to you about the wonderful Alabama channel, and that gives us a lot of access. But there's also something to be said for having that person wearing that League of Women Voters button who attends the city council meeting in person or the school board meeting in person. Now I can get my school board information through my Zoom channel, but they don't know that I was there. If I'm there in person, they know that 
The League of Women Voters is paying attention to what you're doing. You're our elected school board. We just shake hands. We smile nicely. We don't get in their way, but we do report back and we let them know that we are noticing what's going on. Um, we also work with the Girl Scouts in our area to try to teach them the value of, of voting. We've done two projects in the past year. We are present at community events. We were one of the few organizations beyond the uh, African-American community that had any presence at a Juneteenth celebration last June here in Tuscaloosa. That's an important thing to do here in Tuscaloosa because this is not the League of Women Voters that some people thought we were 20 or 30 years ago. We are here today to be the future of the League of Women Voters. And uh, we make position statements on local issues that can go into local media. We serve in many different ways, but the other leagues are doing these things too. And the leagues are also sharing information with each other. So if you know of a local league in your area, reach out to them. If you can't figure out how to reach them, get in touch with Kathy, get in touch with me. We will put you in touch with your members, the membership chair of your local league. If you are somewhere where there is no local league, we also have a process for establishing MAL units, that's member at large units, not just hapless people here and there, but people who are coming together to work to eventually become a local league. We have a process for that. We have to make sure that everything is in line because we are a, a tax uh, responsible organization and we have to make sure everything's in line, but there are experienced people who are there to help you every step of the way. That's how Southeast Alabama recently became a local league. The Shoals area became a local league right before that. These are our two newest local leagues, but we're ready to expand to any other part of the state. Anything else, Kathy, I need to say? I think you hit it. I just, okay. yeah, thank you. And you can see, I, let's see. Um, you can see that we're the league has got a lot of, you know, we're all we're all part of the same organization. But I think it's exciting all the different ways you can get involved. I work state league all week, but on Thursday I'm going to a voter drive. You know, at a, I mean, it's just you can do what you want, and it's and um and like Carol said, if you are wanting to get engaged with your local league and maybe you don't know who to contact then just let us know. We can get you in contact with them. And um, and there's also stuff going on at the state level where we need help as well, because we are we are actually dependent on the local leagues to help us uh, make things happen that are, you know, that are, we're all volunteers. So um, I had one last thing I wanted to show, and then we'll stop and, and just we can all share with each other. I wanted to show you this this chart here. This one graphic, where'd it go? That. Um, on June 23rd through the 25th, there is an event that you're going to hear more about in the really near future. But this is the 10th anniversary of the um, of the um, anniversary of the Supreme Court decision called Shelby v. Holder, which gutted the fifth, uh, the um, part, part five of the Voting Rights Act. Uh, this is that has been the basically the the event which started the destruction of the Voting Rights Act. Um, we're we are going to bring together a lot of different organizations. The league is actually working alongside uh, the NAACP to um, bring this event to to fruition. And um, we are going with Julie Reese and I are the folks that are that are. Um, I'm gonna, if you'll take the spotlight off, Gene, I'm, I'm going to go back to the gallery view. But I wanted to just share that graphic with you to show to show you that event right there. What I would what I would really love to have happen is to get people from all of our local leagues across the state and member at large uh, members as well to sh to to show up in Montevallo University on that weekend and participate in the event. Uh, NAACP is the main planner of the event. Uh, they have requested the League of Women Voters to help them. Um, 
And so Friday night, they're planning to do a march to the courthouse at Columbiana. And then on Saturday morning, they're going to have a rally. And then there's going to be a whole series of panels. And it's all panels that are like nationally recognized figures talking about different aspects of what led to the past to the um, Shelby v. Holder decision. And then also some of the things that have happened that, you know, some of the voter suppression that has come about since that decision has happened. And then that night they're planning a they, they're trying to get a big concert and um, they mentioned who it was that I did not know if Demetrius is still on. Who was that? Who was that? Is he? He may not be here. But they mentioned they mentioned little baby. Little baby. Do you guys know who little baby is? I have. No I know idea. who little baby is. <laughs> oh, OK. Uh, I just thought eight o'clock. That's too late for me. But uh, anyway, it's um, it's really important for us to show up and be in the spaces that, um, you know, these are these are the kind of events where we need to help stand up and speak back to the folks who would suppress voting and also just civil rights. And this is this is an event that will be very important to us. Um, I'm also talking to the National League about helping us pull in people from other parts of the of the South uh, League members from across the southern region. Um, to come in and be there as well. And in my, what I would really also like to see happen is to have a convening of all of the voter services chairs from all of our local leagues to come together and let's strategize about how we're going to be more effective in 2024 in getting out the vote. So that's something I'm talking to Julie and, you know, about making sure we, that, you know, we plan for that and National League is going to, if we could also bring in voter services directors from other leagues across the South, you know, there may be some strategies we can work on that would be where we share and work together with other states to make sure that we, you know, that if there's something happening that's going to affect us, we'll know it. And, um, and so this is, you know, this is, it's not just collaborations with, within Alabama. So, um, that's um that's the kind of thing. And then next year we're going to have the Selma Jubilee again. Uh, they're looking at doing it next year, and then I think the 60th, 2025, is when the 60th anniversary of of the um, Bloody Sunday is going to happen, and that's going to be a big year. So this is something that we're going to be a part of. We're we're our the role. What we're going to do is not defined yet, but if anybody is wanting to get involved in helping to plan what the league is doing in Selma. Um, I'm not going to get up at four in the morning to set up a Jubilee tent next year. But if there's somebody else that would be interested, I would be happy to loan them my tent. But um, but anyway, <laughs> Janelle is laughing, but that's a story in and of itself. But um, but you know, these are so important and it was such a powerful event. I just I'm just not a morning person. So um but we'll work out there may be some other things we can do that, like, for instance, maybe help co-sponsor one of the events down in down in um, Selma or leading up to, to the Bloody Sunday event. We can we'll find ways that we can participate because we are going to show up in those spaces. Um, we're at 735. We're a little bit over. But do you, does anybody want to does anybody have a question? I didn't I don't know if there's anything in the chat that people had questions about. Or if you just want to email them, I don't think we have any uh, questions in the chat so far. But please, please jump in. All right. Yep. And um, hey, Kathy. Yes. Hey, Janella. You just bring the workers. I'm going to be across the street at the hotel, so I can set up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have that hotel across the street. I got to set up. <laughs> yeah, they got the hotel. Yeah, they that would be better than getting up at four in the morning in Montgomery and driving. So yeah. All right, there are ways we can fix this, but thank you guys. And um, if you got ideas for future uh, member development trainings, you know this is something that I'd like to keep going, but and we just need to find topics if we want to like home in on specific things just uh, think about what you'd like to hear about and we can bring in the other local leagues to talk as well and I want to say good night thank you this has been a I think this is great to get us together all right